my name is Ray Hall, and welcome to the 12th Sunday Papers at TAM. 12. So we have limited time budget, and we have six great talks lined up for you, so we'll just get started. Our first, uh, our first speaker is uh, a psychiatrist. His name is Dr. Robert Stern. Uh, he's the Clinical Director of Behavioral Health Services in Iowa Falls, Iowa, and we welcome him to talk to us about myst mystifying, misdefining, and misdiagnosing of dissociation. I think I got that. All right. Welcome, Dr. Stern. Howdy, gang. Uh, this paper came about as a result of my inability to understand what I was reading in a very popular psychological test called the Dissociative Experiences Test. It's a test to screen for multiple personality disorder and a couple other things. Okay. Uh, dissociation started out uh, as uh, hysteria. In 1860, Jean-Martin Charcot, who was the most famous uh, neurologist at the time, got interested in a group of people whose symptoms made no sense to him whatsoever. They'd be paralyzed in their left arm one day, they'd be paralyzed in their right leg the next day, they were blind the third day, uh, and this, uh, he was absolutely convinced that this was due to a neurological lesion, uh, but he could never find the lesion. He finally gave up and said, well, this is psychological, but being a brilliant diagnostician, uh, he said that this is d symptoms of suggestibility, exaggeration, selective amnesia, and attention-seeking behavior. Uh, skip ahead 90 years uh, to the first diagnostic and statistical manual of the uh, American Psychiatric Association. It's uh, conversion hysteria, and uh, dissociation is mentioned as a symptomatic expression of hysteria. In the DSM-2, uh, second edition, uh, you still have hysterical neurosis, but hysteria is broken up into somatoform and conversion disorders, which are the physical expressions, and the purely psychological expressions, which are called the hysterical neurosis uh, dissociative type. Those of you who remember your Monty Python will appreciate the uh, Spanish Inquisition as I go through this. Uh, it's oh, in DSM-2. It's an alteration of consciousness and identity. DSM-3, it's identity, memory, and consciousness. DSM-4, it's consciousness, memory, identity, and perception. And in the DSM-5, which came out last spring, it is consciousness, memory, identity, emotion, perception, body representation, motor control, and behavior. One thing should be patently obvious. There is no diagnosis which would not fit into that definition of dissociation. You could put half of the medical diseases in Western civilization under that diagnosis. Nonetheless, that is what we use. Uh, well, how did that uh, definition get to be? There is no empirical validation for that definition. You have to remember that the DSM is not a scientific document, it is a consensus document. Well, this creates problems for people who want to diagnose multiple personality disorder. Uh, and in 1986, a couple of researchers got together and wrote up the Dissociative Experience Scale. 28 questions uh, to help people diagnose MPD, which is now called dissociative identity disorder. Well, I'm reading through this, and it's not making sense to me. And so I start reading through it. This questionnaire consists of 28 questions, blah, 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 et cetera. Look at the scale, and something's not adding up in the back of my mind. So I go through, and I actually look at it. And, all right, there are four questions. First, you know, uh, I'm sorry, four sentences. First sentence, 28 questions, 24 hours in your day. You know, second sentence, it says, how often? Uh, active voice. Se third sentence, how active passive voice. Fourth sentence, to what degree this experience described in the question applies to you, which I don't know how to answer. And then you are to circle the number to show what percentage of the time these things are happening. 
trying to answer how often something happens on a scale that is measuring how much time something happens is a little bit like asking someone his weight in feet and inches. Well, I got called up the head of the uh, psychology department in our little town. His name is Michael McDonald. Everybody calls him Mac. Oh, hey, Mac, you want to do a little experiment? And we get 58 students together, and we give them the DES, and they zip through the DES. And the moment they turn in their questionnaire, we give them one more questionnaire with one sentence. How did you answer the DES? How often? To what degree? How many hours? Or you didn't know. 33% said they were answering uh, how often. 18 said, yeah, you know, to what degree? How many hours? One of them, and six admitted they didn't know what they were answering. <laughs> Now, this is on a test whose uh, authors state this has good validity and reliability. I mean, this test has taken off like a rocket. Uh, it is used not only to uh, test for multiple personality disorder or dissociative identity disorder as we know it today, but for mood disorders, psychotic disorders, personality disorders, eating disorders, uh, as well as things like irritable bowel syndrome, uh, immune diseases, uh, pelvic inflammatory disease, uh, and uh, there was even one article I read uh, trying to correlate dissociation with belief in Bigfoot and alien abductions. Um, I was stumped. Well, we get these results back. Mac looks at me and he goes, Bob, surely you can't be the first person to see this. And I go, I don't know. So I go through uh, the literature again. These are all published articles in peer-reviewed journals. Uh, this amount, I can't point, but one group of uh, experts say this is the number of times. One group of experts say this is the amount of times. One group of experts, including so one of our uh, speakers, says it's both. And at least one person says it's neither. These are all peer-reviewed journals. Uh, and this is not an, uh, an inclusive uh, list either. This is just what I fit on the uh, PowerPoint slide. Uh, well, this doesn't even get to, uh, to the questions, so let's look at the questions. There are absorption questions, there are amnesia questions, and there are depersonalization, derealization questions. Well, absorption means how much you're concentrating on something. But absorption is not only not pathological, it was never even a part of the definition of dissociation. The argument goes like this. The more you are concentrating on something like a baseball game, the less you are concentrating on the barking dog outside, and therefore you are dissociating. However, if you uh, get distracted by the dark barking dog outside, you have shown a disruption in attention, and therefore you are also dissociating. And uh, if you are watching the baseball game and simultaneously distracted by the barking dog, you are also dissociating because you have split your attention. Uh, you can't go wrong with a definition like this. Uh, well, there are also 16 amnesia questions. The questions ask you how to remember not only what you forgot, but to put it in the form of a percentage. <laughs> and there are deep depersonalization and derealization questions, which is asking you to quantify your feelings. And it's a little bit like asking you, you know, what, at what percentage do you love your neighbor? I'm, how do you answer that? Uh, well, it occurred to me that this wasn't due to some sort of distortion of psychological principles. This was just plain bad writing. Uh, let me show you the, some of the questions. Some people sometimes find that when they are alone, they talk out loud to themselves. Show the percentage. Do you sometimes never talk to yourself? Do you sometimes always talk to yourself? Or you fall under the bell curve with the rest of us are people who sometimes, sometimes talks to yourself. I have no idea how to answer that. But this is small fry stuff. Try this one. Uh, some people are told that they sometimes don't recognize friends or family members. Well, if you're stuck in a room with your Aunt Esmeralda and somebody flicks on the light 
for 10 times for one second each time, and five of those seconds you recognize Aunt Esmeralda, and five you don't, and for five of those seconds you recognize Aunt Esmeralda, and for five you don't, and you feel this applies to you 50% of the time, and you circle 50%, yeah, you have answered the question, right? Wrong. It's not asking you how often you don't recognize Aunt Esmeralda. It's asking you how often you're told that you don't aunt, uh, uh, recognize Aunt Esmeralda. She's still going to be upset no matter what. Well, like I said, this is simply bad writing. So I go to my old Strunk and Whites, and there are the answers primarily in Chapter 2. Use the active voice. Put statements in a positive form. Use uh, specific concrete language, omit needless words, and you avoid the use of qualifiers. Well, so I rewrote the uh, instructions and said, well, how many times a day and how many hours a day do you talk to yourself? And I rewrote about 16 of the questions. In addition, I asked uh, them how often they spend going to school or work, uh, spending eating, and how much time they spend sleeping. But I wanted to know if there was a correlation between what they said they were doing and what they said they were dissociating from doing. Here are the stats. 43 of the 58 finished the uh, questionnaires. The average DES score was 23, which is considered fairly normal for college students and pathological for anybody else. Uh, <laughs> you can make of that what you will. The average number of, a 20, of hours in a 24-hour day that they spent in these 16, not in the full 28, uh, questions was 48 hours a day, with dissociation ranges up to 1,700%. Was there a correlation? Apparently not. This might make uh, statisticians happy, but it doesn't give you an idea of what these students actually said. So let me give you some examples. Student number one said uh, he got so involved in watching TV that he was able to uh, tune out things 90% of the time. How many hours do you watch TV? None. This was no accident. Well, when I checked the frequency scores, how many times a day do you watch TV? None. Highway hypnosis, you know, driving down the street and not remembering how uh, all are part of the trip. Student number one again, he dissociates 40% of his travel time. How many hours a day do you travel? None. <laughs> Contrast that with student number 16 who remembers everything as part of his trip and spends 10 hours a day traveling to and from school or work, which is the equivalent of traveling like from San Diego to here and back every day. Autoprosopagnosia is one of those $3 words you will never see outside of a spelling bee or a neurology unit. It means the inability to recognize your own face. It is extremely rare, it is extremely debilitating. Nonetheless, 13 of our students in our little town of 5,000 people suffer from this rare malady. Uh, one of whom said uh, he uh, doesn't recognize himself 90% of the time for one hour a day. Uh, contrast that with student number 14 who always recognizes himself but spends six hours a day looking at himself in the mirror. Uh -huh. Suggestive of another psychiatric malady called narcissism. All the students daydream, but two of them said they daydreamed 100% of the time, <laughs> including while taking these tests, which I could certainly believe. Um, student number 14 uh, said he was able to ignore pain 90% of the time. When asked how, much, how many hours he was in pain, he said, none. <laughs> well, it's always easier to uh, ignore pain when it's someone else's. Um, and. Uh, half the students said they were hallucinating uh, during uh, One of whom, however, said that, that uh, he never hallucinated once daily. Uh, absolutely worthy of Alice in Wonderland. Well, what can you say about my little test? Some people sometimes exaggerate, some exaggerate more than others. Some people learned, haven't learned that there's only 100% of anything. Some people haven't learned that there are only 24 hours a day, even when it's written in great big black letters at the top of the page. Some people will say yes to anything, and some people don't know what the hell they're talking about. <laughs> what can you say about the DES? 
It's a test whose instructions and questions aren't understood by the subjects taking it, whose answers are recorded on a scale which can't measure them, in order to test for a group of disorders which can't be defined, but with good validity and reliability. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and with 25 seconds to go. Dr. Stern, thank you for setting the bar rather high for the rest of the speakers. But uh, anybody have a question for Dr. Stern? We have time for one or two questions. Please come uh, stand up and come to the center if you have a question. How did this happen? <laughs> well, at the end of this test, I called up Mac and I said, Mac, I don't think psychology should be taught as an academic subject. Any other questions for our speaker? All right, well, thank you, Dr. Stern, very much for that. Excellent, wake up. Our next speaker is uh, Mr. Jacques Rousseau. He is uh, the uh, head of the Free Society Institute, and he comes from us all the way from Cape Town. So he's here to talk about the responsible believer. Jacques. Thank you, Ray. Good morning. These uh, celebrations of reason, I think you might all agree, take place in what you could describe as a general climate of unreason. From your towns to South Africa, where I come from, which you might know from Oscar Pistorius or that other Nelson Mandela fellow, there's something fairly simple I think we can do which could help assist in, in combating this climate of reason. And I think I could summarize it by saying that one of the important lessons that the skeptical community can teach others is that things are often uncertain. We might have very good reasons to believe in something, yet not feel entitled to claim that we can be sure of it. And this attitude of epistemic prudence, i.e. not making claims that aren't warranted, aren't sufficiently warranted by the evidence, alongside a certain humility, and by that I mean the ability to accommodate the possibility that you might be wrong, are essential resources for being a responsible believer, which is what I'm talking about here. So the idea of epistemic prudence is worth dwelling on for a moment. I think one striking difference between skeptical thinkers and non-skeptical thinkers is their attitude towards certainty. I'd like to suggest that a skeptical thinker would be far more likely to recognize that when we speak of truth, we're typically talking about something that is the best justified conclusion available to us, rather than something we would claim to be certain of. By contrast, I think that non-skeptical thinkers often entertain the fantasy that they can be more sure of things than they are entitled to say. Justification is therefore our proxy for truth. It's our method of triangulating it. It's our method of approximating it. And a focus on justification rather than certainty can remind the community, remind the people that we interact with, that they need to adopt this more modest attitude to, you, to what you can claim to know for sure. So as I say, the non-skeptical view is that things can be known for certain. And what that leads to is a cycle of absurd proof and disproof of things, as you all know, when you engage with the media, where things become true and then false when the next study is revealed or released. So here's one example. The diet wars are a current and fitting example where moderation and any kind of nuance and scientific understanding is ground up by inflated claims that one particular diet is the only way to go, it's going to save your life or it's going to kill you. Or this example that sugar is not just something to be careful of, as we all know, but something that is both addictive and perhaps even the new tobacco. So it creates a kind of risk society whereby people stop thinking and stop being able to think about a nuanced view of something and instead leap towards dogmatism. And I think the temperature of these debates inside the skeptical community, inside the popular science community, might be far more comfortable and far more fruitful if proponents adopted a more considered tone and resisted claiming the final word on things. 
After all, our knowledge is contingent on what we can know at a given time, what we can possibly know. And the chances that you get something right now, at any particular point in time, are therefore often vanishingly small. Secondly, I'd like to encourage us to consider adopting a more hu humble attitude towards our epistemology. Being able to recognize that you might be wrong is an essential component of being persuasive in teaching people about how to think about scientific claims. A smugness or overconfidence regarding the set of ideas that you regard as true might sometimes be justified, sure, leaving aside the question of how politically attractive that might be or how effective it might be, but it could also be a sign that your belief has to some extent ossified or calcified. I think our convictions can become a, a kind of item of faith rather than something we hold as a responsible belief, i.e. it's something we regard as potentially falsifiable. And I think it's exactly because skeptics tend to be good at this that we need to remind ourselves sometimes to do a kind of diagnostic check, especially perhaps in situations where we are emotionally invested in a conclusion. And the point is that being better at avoiding things like confirmation bias and other sorts of common ways of getting things wrong doesn't make us immune to them, and perhaps it might make it a particularly problematic blind spot for us because we feel that we're good at it already. So in light of the fact that the world is complex and that we can only know what is available to us at any given time, it should strike us as surprising, I think, how seldom we hear people say things like, I simply don't know. I do not have an answer to that question. We tend in instead to come up with an answer and then defend it in a post hoc kind of fashion. Those of you who've read Jonathan Haidt's work will know that he uses this as a way to explain moral reasoning, where he speaks about the emotional dog wagging the rational tail. We come up with a conclusion, we feel very strongly about it, and then we act as a lawyer in a sense and try to justify that belief instead of saying, well, hold on, you've caught me out, I actually don't have an argument for that view, I take it back, I take back what I said in a sense. We're stubborn, we don't like to be wrong. So once we make that uh, commitment, that emotional commitment to something, we're reluctant to confess that we could have made a mistake. And this sort of escalation of certainty, this hyperbole, closes off the space for nuance. And I think that we, as skeptics, are the ones who have the best, uh, we're best placed, in a sense, to defend this more considered and nuanced way of expressing our views. To add to the difficulty of entertaining and encouraging this considered style of debate, the widespread availability of information via the internet has arguably democratized the concept of expertise itself. And the idea of authority and who can act as an authority are under constant challenge from anybody who has an internet connected device, i.e. everybody. And while it's of course true that we shouldn't accept the word or the testimony of authorities in an uncritical sort of way, we should surely still accept that authority and expertise are not the sorts of things you can get via Google. I mean, there are lots of people here in the medical profession, and I'm sure you are dismayed by how Dr. Google is often the first port of call for, for patients. Sometimes, in fact, most of the time, somebody out there will know more than you do, and you could quite possibly be wrong. And I think we should remind ourselves of that more often. And I think another aspect of, of what this death of authority means is that no matter what your point of view is, you can find somebody who will support it. And reinforce your belief while you, in joining that community, reinforce theirs, and you, in a sense, have this, have this uh, in a sense, escalation of confusion with all of you walking away believing you're the authorities and everybody else baffling the obtuse on the matter. Eli Paris's concept of the filter bubble, I think, articulates this well. Because if you're looking for evidence of Bigfoot on a cryptozoology website, you're of course going to find it. And you might well end up walking away believing in the Loch Ness Monster too, because that's the kind of thing you'll get exposed to on that website. So there's the self-supporting web of evidence, which is immune to, in a sense, correction from the outside. And as you all know, with conspiracy theories, the situation gets even more absurd, in that being unable to prove your theory is evidence of a conspiracy by others to hide the relevant evidence, therefore leaving you more entitled to believe what you'd like to believe. So combine this filter bubble and this democratization of the idea of expertise with the nonsense of a kind of blanket generalized respect for the opinions of others, and we quickly end up drinking too deeply from the well of postmodernism, where truth takes a back seat to sensation, and where simply being heard takes so much effort 
that we either withdraw from debate entirely or we become superficially smug. I'm not accusing the press types of being superficially smug, but people who engage with science on a kind of meme level via BuzzFeed or the internet or whatever, you should have come across people who don't seem to have an understanding of what they're talking about, yet feel quite smug about their, their uh, rectitude in, in the conclusions that they're expressing. And despite the complications I've sketched now, I think we can develop as well as teach resources for separating unjustified from justified conclusions and for being more responsible believers. And what I mean by responsible believers is both taking responsibility for our beliefs, i.e. holding ourselves to account for them, but secondly also holding beliefs responsibly, in other words forming them as carefully as possible and changing our minds when it's appropriate to do so. Some of you might have read Peter Bogosian's uh, 2013 book, he was here last year, A Manual for Creating Atheists, and in there he introduces the concept of street epistemology, which are simple but effective rhetorical and logical maneuvers that we can deploy in everyday situations. In a similar vein, I'd like to articulate a few concepts that can serve as resources for making it more likely that we end up with responsible beliefs and also that we encourage responsible belief formation in others. So, the, many of our blind spots in argumentation, I think, involve not understanding or taking full cognizance of the politics of the conversation, rather than focusing on, on the logic of the argument. Okay, so forgetting that arguments and debates occur in the context. In the heat of battle, we forget about all the things that our books have taught us and that our, our lessons in logic might have taught us. Debates occur in a context rather than in this hypothetical space of reasons. So to borrow from Dan Dennett's uh, book last year, Tuition Pumps, um, we might usefully remind ourselves of Rappaport's rules. We're in engaging with an argument, with an opponent. Rappaport's rules invite us to do the following. To first attempt to re-express our target's position so clearly, vividly and fairly, that they say thanks, I wish I'd thought of it. Secondly, to list any points of agreement, especially if they're not matters of widespread or general agreement. Third, mention anything that you might have learned from your opponent. And only then are you permitted to start with rebuttal or criticism. One immediate effect of following these rules is that your target becomes a more receptive audience for your criticism than they would otherwise have been. Then, the distinction between explanations and reasons is worth dwelling on. Rosenblatt and Kale from Yale University speak about the illusion of explanatory depth. We're inclined to believe that we have a great handle on our argument and our explanation. Those of you who teach, like me, have the feeling of preparing a lesson plan and thinking it's crystal clear and then walking out and somebody asks you a question and you suddenly find yourself a little bit dumbfounded as to how to answer it. So they argued that instead of trying to provide reasons for our beliefs, we should try to provide explanations for them. For example, instead of asserting that you need universal health care because everybody is equal and therefore entitled to care, try instead explaining how your scheme would work. Who would benefit, how would they benefit, who would pay for it, etc. So in other words, showing your workings, demonstrating that you understand the logical flow of the argument or of the claim you're making, stands a better chance both of persuading somebody else and secondly, revealing to yourself the flaws and how you could improve your own arguments. Secondly, a thing that you all, I'm sure, are aware of, the backfire effect. Perceived threats don't make critical reflection easier for your opponent. If they feel like they've been threatened or challenged, ego certainly does come into it. We don't like our deep convictions being challenged, and perhaps this causes us to dig in our epistemic heels. So again, this is about politics and the tone of argumentation, whereby we should try to be charitable to the fact that the other person is deeply convinced of their point of view for sincere reasons of their own, whether they're high quality reasons or not. Consider the possible long-term implications of, of how we can, via the backfire effect, rule out certain criticism as out of order. It stands the potential of running a, of, of getting us onto a kind of slippery slope. Because once you rule out one set of criticisms, how much easier might it be to rule out a second set or a third set until you eventually become as epistemically virtuous as an astrologer. So, we create our own filter bubbles, potentially, in skeptical gatherings like TAM, and all of these sorts of conferences, and we need to guard against that. 
There's no shame in saying, I don't know. So I'm arguing that there's a strong signaling value in nuance. There's a strong signaling value to those outside the community and those inside the community to acknowledge the possibility that things are complicated and that certainty is often not available to us. Our skeptical currency, our value of skeptics, is invested in the fighting for a considered view and showing how it's often the most accurate reflection of the, of the data available to us. And a certain certainty can do harm to that political cause. Skepticism is not, after all, about simply being right. It's about effecting change in the world. It's about persuading people to take more responsible attitudes towards factual claims. And merely reinforcing our identity as skeptics and feeling smug about that can get in the way of effecting this change. So we should all try to help other people develop resources for being better believers, for believing in true things rather than false things. <coughs> so to conclude, Skepticism is not a conclusion, it's a way to reach conclusions. And our job is to always demonstrate that method, to always demonstrate that way of reaching conclusions rather than asserting those conclusions. Setting the example is a vital part of our mission. It's the way that we encourage and inspire others to adopt these strategies. And I'd like to suggest that as humanism is to ethics, i.e. A, a kind of woo-free inspiration, and guide for living a good life, skepticism can be for science, providing responsible examples and guidance of how to be a responsible believer and the importance of holding yourself accountable for that. Thank you. Thank you, John. We have time for one or two questions. Does anybody have a question for our speaker? Do you think that more speech available improves the level of discourse? Yeah, that's a good question. It's a, in theory, it should certainly do so, yes. But I mean, as, as I'm sure we're all aware, there's a very, very high, or very low rather, signal to noise ratio out there in the, in the blogosphere. <coughs> so we do need to develop resources for, for separating good sources from bad. So yes, in theory, it does. But the noise can drown out the quality stuff. And also, because of a kind of climate of sensationalism, where, as always, headlines sell. It's, I think, easy to game that system and spread nonsense via, via popularity. So yes, in theory, but we need to develop resources for, for moderating the quality of those resources, too. Okay. 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 A hand for our speaker. Thank you. And in terms of vetting resources, see our talk from last year on rebutter, right? I think we addressed that a little bit in our Sunday session last year. So our next speaker is uh, Dr. Stuart Robbins. He's a PhD research scientist at the University of Colorado Boulder. His specialty is planetary and geophysics. And uh, also he has a, a blog called Exposing Pseudo-Astronomy. Pseudo Pseudo -astronomy. So uh, please welcome uh, Dr. Stuart Robbins, who's gonna talk to us or ask the question, Sidonia, mathematical keys to the numerology of Mars? speaker, so lower the mic. Um, so I'm going to talk about something that I don't think has been talked about much of Tam. I'm going to do sort of a straightforward uh, debunking. And I'm going to focus on this Cydonia region of Mars. And Cydonia really isn't, uh, it, it's not that special. It's just a region of the planet. We named a lot of regions in the early 1900s based on telescopic observations that just showed Lightness, di uh, lightness differences, color differences, slight differences across the planet in early telescopes. And Cydonia happened to be one of those regions. Now, it was made famous and perhaps the king of all, or the queen, depending on, uh, I don't remember exactly what Cydonia means, but it's the 
the cornerstone of a lot of space anomalies, and that's because it's in Cydonia that in 1976, scientists from NASA unveiled Viking photograph 035A72, which had the face on Mars, the infamous face, this mile-long feature that looked like a face under certain lighting conditions. And unfortunately, that sort of sparked this uh, modern-day anomaly hunting on other planets. And on Mars, it's rife for anomaly hunting because an anomaly is very simple. You, you see something in any of the literally millions of photographs we have of the planet, you don't understand it, and immediately it's whatever. It's aliens or Bigfoot. There is a, a picture of pareidolia of Bigfoot on Mars, or there's Jesus on Mars, or almost anything else. And so what I'm going to take you through is a case study of some numerology claims or numerological claims that have been used to argue that the broader Cydonia region, all of these features that you see in this image, all combine to claim, to show that Mars was created, or at least this region was laid out and the features were created by some sort of intelligence. You might almost say it was uh, intelligently designed, but I don't quite go that far. So uh, this particular version of the claim I'm going to be addressing is uh, made by Richard C. Hoagland. For those who don't know Richard C. Hoagland, he's one of the original Face on Mars guys. He's, if you really do anything about or look at anything about um, uh, space or astronomy anomalies, you're going to come across Richard Hoagland. He's the guy on the SGU, and I'll back away a little bit, who Phil Plate goes, Hoagland! So that's, that's Hoagland. Um, this particular claim, as I said, is about numerology. In particular, there are, in this case, 19 features that show numerological relationships that could not possibly, the claim goes, be created by nature, natural processes. They do this by looking at different kinds of features. So, for example, uh, the angle between the staircase, between me and the panel table, that would be one angle that would be measured. Uh, another angle could be um, the angle between me and Ray and the guy backstage. That could be another angle. And if we convert those angles from degrees to radians, which is just multiplying by a scaling factor, we get a small number that's a key number and an irrational number. It's something like the square root of 3 or pi or perhaps the square root of 5 divided by pi. And because that's a, a weird, irrational number, it can't possibly be created by nature. So the claim goes. The claim also goes that these angles are made to three significant figures, accuracy. That's like saying it's, it's exactly 1.32. Or that's also uh, saying that the ratio of the first angle divided by the next angle is one of these numbers. Or that the tangent, or the cosine, or the sine, and so very quickly, you can start to see that this might not be the most precise of claims, but it goes further. There's a, a feature called the Diendem Pyramid, named for Vince Di Pietro and Greg Molinar, who were some of the Faith on Mars researchers in the 1980s. It's been termed the mathematical Rosetta Stone of Cydonia because all of the angles and all of the ratios and all of the trigonometry, all of these then small numbers find themselves in, interestingly, the Diendem Pyramid. So it can be used to read the mathematics of the broader Cydonia region. And so because they really start with the Diendem Pyramid, I'm going to start with an analysis of that. So first we're going to address the part of three significant figures. And what I'm showing you here is the latest high resolution imagery of this shape. And as you can see, it's not a perfect pentagram. In fact, it's really hard to figure out where the walls are, where the edges are. And when I drew this three or four times in the space of a half hour, I got completely different results. You can squint your eyes and you can guess and you can get something that sort of maybe converges at the same apex point. But trying to claim that this is an accurate measurement to three significant figures is a little bit silly. And that's illustrated by this movie as well, where I've taken what the anomalists claim are significant angles in the, the middle column, uh, or I guess the column in the middle of the slide, 
I then show you my angle measurement, and then I show you the percentage different or difference. And the angle measurement is done by just shifting the vertices a little teeny tiny bit. And right now I've faded in the Viking era imagery, which has a pixel of about 50 meters, so pretty much like the, the width of this room, versus CTX is seven and a half meters, maybe half the width of this stage. What you're seeing is the percent difference where I've color coded red as being greater than 1%, yellow as being less than 1%, and green as being less than 0.1%. So that's sort of a proxy for one significant figure, two significant figures, or three significant figures. And you might notice that it's mostly red, and that's because they don't match. But another issue is that there are a lot of angles here. They've only pointed out, in this case, nine. However, there are actually 35 angles in this pentagram. That means that there are also 595 ratios between all of those angles, one angle divided by another, which also means that there are 105 trigonometric relationships, because you have sine, cosine, and tangent of any of those angles. When you match it to a significant number, you have 94 different significant numbers you can match to. This all points to a lot of cherry picking, which I'll get to in a few slides. But for the sake of completeness, when I actually do the measurements on the latest data, and I basically check the work of what was done 30 years ago, only two of the claimed significant numbers actually match to three significant figures. That's the cosine of angle E, which is allegedly equal to the square root of five divided by the constant E, and the angle of D divided by angle F, so a ratio, which is equal to pi over the square root of five. Okay, maybe that's significant, maybe not. One thing that we like to do in physics and related fields like mine, astronomy, is something called a Monte Carlo simulation. So Monte Carlo is where you basically want to understand the statistics of what would be going on if this were a purely random phenomenon. In this case, I've simulated 15,000 pentagrams. I've measured the 35 angles, the 595 ratios, and everything else, and I've compared those with the 95 different, uh, uh, different special numbers. And when I say I, I mean a computer code, because that would be a lot of numbers. And I've been the results. Uh, in the top graph, you're seeing the number of so 735 possible important numbers. How many of them match the 94 allegedly not numbers that can appear in nature. In the bottom graph, you're seeing the same thing, but to 0.1% versus 1%. And what you're seeing is a buildup of these statistics. What you need to understand the null hypothesis, the null hypothesis being what you would expect from pure random chance. The null hypothesis is this is a natural feature. Let's get the statistics. The average on the top is you would expect 222 of these numbers to be significant you would expect to three significant figures, about 22 of them. And what just came on that you can't actually read are one sigma and two sigma lines. One sigma is where you have about 70% of the data. Two sigma is where you have about 95% of the data, which means that outside of those, you have about two and a half percent on either wing. In physics, the magic number is a five sigma detection. That means that there is less than a one in one million chance that your result is due to pure random fluctuations, random chance. Uh, for example, the Higgs boson. When that was first announced from CERN that, hey, we found it, it was a four and a half sigma detection. Then it was a few months later when they built up enough statistics that it was actually now the magic five sigma detection. In this case, what's being shown by the red arrow is exactly where the DNDEM pyramid lies. It is right within one sigma, which means that statistically speaking, this is a pure, random, natural feature that shows absolutely nothing out of the ordinary. It's, it just, it's natural. Uh, but some people don't like that answer. It almost seems superfluous now to go to the Cydonia region and do this exact same thing. You might notice in this case, though, that there are a lot more yellows and a lot more greens that are popping up, and that's because with Cydonia, you don't have set features that you're trying to match to. In, in a pentagram, you have an edge and a, a line through the middle, 
But with Cydonia, and we're now overlaid as the Viking imagery, you can really pick and choose whatever you want and say that that's a significant feature. If this particular pyramid that you're calling a pyramid doesn't actually fit your numbers, then you can just go to the pyramid a kilometer over and it fits your numbers. And because we're skeptics and we like uh, logical fallacies, this is the Texas sharpshooter fallacy. Uh, it's, you get a bunch of data, in this case, 735 different possible angles, ratios of trig. You look for any cluster and say, hey, look, 29 of these match these particular significant numbers. And because they match that three, I'm drawing my target around it. And hey, look, there are 29 significant numbers in my target. You can ignore the other 700 that I'm not telling you about, but there are 29 numbers in my target, and therefore it's significant. And this is very closely related to the cherry picking because I've now just plucked my numbers and said, hey, there we go, those are the ones that are important. So what are the lessons learned in the other applications to broader skepticism, broader debunking exercises? Well. First off from this, you have to have an a priori model of what is a significant number because you can't just look at your data and figure out what's there and then say, well, because there's this cluster, that is what is significant. In this case, it's just numerology and it applies to a lot of other things like say, I'm hunting Bigfoot. Well, what a priori is going to count as a Bigfoot photograph? If you don't have that in mind, then you can take a picture of something blurry and say, yeah, that counts just because that's what I got. You also need to know what the background level statistics are in order to be able to accept or reject the null hypothesis. If you don't know what you would expect from pure random chance, you can't say, well, this is beyond chance. This couldn't possibly be natural. You just, you can't say that. Making that claim is, Really ridiculous. Uh, you also need to know the limitations of your image analysis and data. In this case, 50 meters per pixel, it was great for the 1970s. We did a lot of science and still do a lot of science with Viking data. But when you're analyzing a feature that's a kilometer or two kilometers across with 50 meter pixels and claiming that you can do this and measure angles to three significant figure accuracy, it's just impossible. And this applies to a lot, a lot of things. Like, there, uh, where's the birth certificate? You know, the whole birther stuff with the birth certificate, that has to do with image analysis and understanding what the images are showing you. It's the same thing with the Twin Towers, with various photographic and image anomalies, and you have to be able to understand the limitations of your data. You also have to be wary of pareidolia. In astronomy, I mean, the whole fact that we have constellations, that is pareidolia. But in astronomy claims in general, especially from Richard Hoagland and others, we deal with a lot of pareidolia. In this case, in Cydonia, we're connecting a face with a pyramid and another pyramid and a fortress and a tank and a city square and various other things. And when your claim is based on connecting these features that supposedly are intelligently created to begin with, you've already reached your conclusion before you've even started to gather your data. So with that in mind, I have uh, 45 seconds left. So I will say that um, I did a detailed analysis of this that perhaps makes slightly more cohesion sense or cohesive sense or whatever that phrase is supposed to be. Uh, it can be found at YouTube at this link or um, various other areas. Uh, I do want to also thank Sharon Hill at Doubtful News for helping to promote that. And that's the talk. Thank you, Stuart. Once again, we have time for one or two questions for Stuart. Any questions? They seem convinced. More so than people I argue with online. I can't argue. These folks know their math. They can't argue with it. Well, thank you again, Stuart, very much.
So our next uh, presenter is using the president. It takes a little longer to get it pop up. So we're pleased to welcome Chris Gast. He is the president of the Australian Skeptics, uh, the, uh, the Victorian branch. Um, he's a software developer with a back academic background in philosophy and uh, prepared himself for some more math. Uh, you've heard of the great book, How to Live Statistics. Well, it gets even more fun if you use Bayesian statistics. So here to explain that to us. Uh, hi everyone. Um, what you, this glaring uh, neon equation we're all looking at is uh, Bayes' theorem. Okay, it, it represents a way to uh, improve that probability of a hypothesis, giving extra evidence as it's gained. Uh, now, I've got a feeling maths can be a bit ominous for some people, but there's laughter in this as well. It's all, it's all going to be fun, okay? Now, uh, you know, this is 18th century mathematics. It's, it's all fairly established. It, it's used extensively in a lot of scientific and medical research. Uh, it's it's used in a lot of software applications like, uh, you know, image processing, so for example, facial recognition. Um, I've used it for text classification, like uh, spam filtering and so on. It gets, gets a bit of use in, um, you know, consumer prediction and uh, risk analysis. Uh, and and I, I don't have an axe to grind with uh, the approach per se. It, it's, it's very established, but there are some, you know, peculiar cases that uh, are worth delving into. So I want to start at first with a simple real-world <coughs> example of uh, Bayesian inference that's, that's used in a, a fairly a reasonably valid way. Uh, now with HIV testing, the preliminary stage is uh, called an ELISA test. Uh, it, it records a false positive rate of about 1 in 10,000. So if you've got a low risk population of, of males getting this test, for every 10,000 men, you, you'll get one of those men who, who've got HIV. Now, that, that'll probably lead to one true positive result. But then of all the men without HIV, you'll probably get one false positive result. Now, with uh, a high-risk population, you'll have uh, 150 or so with HIV, 150 true positives and, uh, you know, probably one false positive. Now, now, we've been told that this has got a false positive rate of 1 in 10,000. So, it, you know, we'd be kind of assuming that if you get this result, it's 9,999 times in 10,000 correct. So, but what are the chances? of having HIV, given that an ELISA test comes back positive. It, it actually depends, our level of certainty depends on which population we're measuring. Uh, now, I'll, I'll throw in a, a bit of maths here, okay? Now, every time we see this vertical stroke, um, that, that's just shorthand for saying given that. Uh, in this case, we're trying to figure out the probability of the HIV positive status, given that uh, we've got a, a, a positive ELISA test. And we'll, we'll, plug, we'll plug this into the equation we, we saw in the first slide. Uh, it, you know, it's not too scary. Uh, and using all the numbers we just had on the previous slide, uh, for the low risk population, we, we get this results, it's less than 50%. Uh, now for the high risk rate, it, if you get a positive result in the test, you're about 99% sure that you've probably got HIV. So if we're told the test is accurate 9,999 times out of 10,000, it's, it's a little bit counterintuitive to expect a positive result to be wrong 50% of the time. Our, our minds just aren't good with naturally 
skewed towards dealing with probabilities. And uh, there's, there's often been a lot of problems with this. There's been tragic instances where there hasn't been sufficient post-test counselling and people have committed suicide, misunderstanding of this kind of uh, probabilities perhaps fuel the fire of uh, AIDS denialism. Um, but, and in this case, we're talking about something that's, that's all, the terms are relatively well known and um, that can be derived from observation. Now, now things get fairly curious when we get involved in looking, trying to guess probabilities without empirical corroboration and, and turning to areas you know, of, of study where this, this kind of thing doesn't happen all the time. Now, back to, back to the original neon sign, I'll, I'll just go through a bit of terminology. The initial probability we're dealing with is known as the prior probability. Then this, the, the other term that introduced as the new evidence is known as the likelihood. We've got a normalising constant on the bottom. We'll get rid of that later. Uh, and the, the final outcome is known as the posterior probability. And, okay, the, the, the next bit is probably the most important bit of maths in this talk, if, if you're going to remember anything. Um, I just want to talk about conditional independence. Now, if you're dealing with the probability of two events, uh, it's, the probability of those two events is going to be equal to the, um, the uh, multiplication of those probabilities on the provisor that they're conditionally independent things. They're not in some way causally related. Um, I'll give an example with a deck of cards. So the probability of drawing an ace of hearts from a deck of cards is equal to the probability of drawing a heart times the probability of drawing an ace. So it's, it's 1 in 52. And that, that, that's the case of you know, the, um, the, the uh, suite of, of the cards and the, the uh, numbering on the cards, it's all, uh, it's, it's conditionally independent. That's fine. But if we're to say the probability of drawing a number and drawing an even number, we, we can't just multiply those probabilities because one is completely dependent on the other. Now, now we'll we get back to this later on in the talk. Now, I've, I've given an example of appropriate use. I, I want to tell you about some of the uh, more egregious uses of um, Bayesian uh, reasoning. Okay, so, of course, I, I want to talk to you about Jesus. <laughs> now, no, I'll, I'll go in for the apologist uh, Bayesian Jesus, and then I'll also cover the uh, secularist Bayesian Jesus. Uh, First off, uh, Timothy and Linda McGrew were some theologians. They had a paper called The Argument for Miracles. And, um, you know, they, they tried to rescue the argument of miracles from the, the jaws of David Hume, pretty much. And uh, their hypothesis is that Jesus was resurrected from the dead. And their facts that they're using to support this, the testimony of the women, the uh, testimony of the disciples that saw Jesus after he'd come back to life, and also the, the uh, conversion of Paul on the road to Damascus. Um, now, with the chance of being we're dealing here, we're trying to find the chance of, being, of Jesus being resurrected given a set of facts. Now, now they do this in uh, an odds form. Of, so they, they try to establish a ratio of that compared to the, ratio, the uh, chance of Jesus not being resurrected given the same set of facts. Um, so we can, um, let's try to figure this out. The first term is the, uh, the prior. So, you know, as a starting point, what are the chances Jesus, someone could just be resurrected from the dead? 
and they multiply that by, the, you know, the, uh, the likelihood, given what the women have said, you know, is it more likely for someone to come back from the dead? And uh, given what the disciples have uh, testified on pain of martyrdom and so forth, and, you know, and, and then the uh, conversion of Paul. So they're all in terms. And, and notice these facts have been expanded out with um, an assumption of conditional independence. Now, they're pretty charitable to the kind of, you know, sceptical cause that they think people being resurrected from the dead, you know, the odds are something like 10 duo decillion to one. You know, I'm, I'm, that, that seems about right to me. <laughs> uh, but then they look at what the women have to say and that they think they're honest people and, you know, the chances of them lying would be kind of about 100 to one. Now, now they count about 13 people as disciples and they're all pretty honest blokes and, you know, each one's conditionally independent of the next, so that's, you know, about a thousand to one each and they, oh, some, something curious happened there. <laughs> and, and, and Paul too, he, he, he's a pretty honest bloke. So, so the, uh, the, uh, when, when we're dealing with the evidence, it's um, you know, 100 uh, tredecillion to one that, um, that these guys are fibbing about. And so we end up with the odds against Jesus not being resurrected at 10,000 to one. Okay, now the question is, should we take this to our bookie? Um, but I, I think they're on the right track. I think, you know, if you, but the, the premise here is extraordinary claims, you know, 10 to the minus 40 require extraordinary evidence. But what, what I guess we're all differing on is whether this is extraordinary evidence. I, I think the problem is that they've set their likelihood terms at impossibly high values. They claim all the facts are conditionally independent, but that kind of rules out the possibility of some kind of collusion between these witnesses or uh, hallucinations, those sorts of things that a lot of us might think of likely explanations. And uh, th this is a, it, it's not a crazy paper, it's well researched, the, the maths looks right, there's lots of, you know, references to scholarship, but it's been reviewed by theologians, you know, statisticians haven't taken much of a look at this. Now, I'm all for teaching the controversy, okay? So, I want to talk about uh, Richard Carrier and his, um, his um, position on this. He's a prominent humanist plus, uh, and a classical scholar. Now, he's, um, he's just put out a book, I haven't had a lot of time to look at it, that's 700 pages long, that sets out to, to demolish the existence of Jesus using a, a Bayesian argument. But what, what I'm talking, it, it, it's, there's some quality scholarship in there, but uh, what I'm looking at today is an earlier paper that he, um, he looks at the um, issues with the passage in Tacitus that um, that um, ties together Christ and Pontius Pilate and um, the persecution of uh, Christians by Nero. Now, the uh, passage is known as the Testimony of Tacitus. I'll, I'll just say TT from here on in because you know, I'm running short on time. Uh, and, and he deals with um, four bits of it, four facts that would lead us to believe that it might not be accurate, that it may have been played with by uh, you know, Christian scribes at a later date. So that, for example, this, no, it, this passage in um, a Roman book has no influence on Christian stories about persecutions. There's no explicit mention of it by other Christians till the fourth century. No Latin or Greek mentions till the fourth century. And it also, it, it lends itself to interpolation perhaps because it fits some other kind of cult rather than the actual Christian cult. Um, so he, he starts off saying, you know, it's 200 to one that someone would have fluffed around with this passage in an old Roman book. 
And then he puts together some other figures. Uh, um, I won't go into details as to where he gets them from. But, but, but it, it's starting to take the form of a fairly similar kind of argument. Uh, again, we're, we're looking at um, all these terms being multiplied together. And, you know, he, he, um, we, we end up with the odds against this passage being authentic or, about, uh, or over 3 to 1. Now, what the problem is exactly the same as the uh, problem with the McGraw's paper. We've, uh, we've got this assumption of conditional independence thrown in here. Uh, the proof assumes that all these things are independent, but we really, that, that's not, that's something for, uh, that, that's not a, an obvious thing, given that we're talking about historical absence of, um, of um, references to these passages. I, I don't, I can't quite fathom them. So if any of these um, facts are mutually dependent, then the whole mathematical argument is invalid. Uh, I, I just want to say, look, it, it, it's a Bayesian analysis is a fairly powerful technique, but we, we just have to keep an eye out for in some cases like this where there can be some um, circular reasoning, you know, and it's just used as a gloss on top of it, or if there's some, um, you know, undue assumptions of uh, conditional independence. Okay, thanks. Yeah, we have time for a couple of questions. Any questions for Chris? Yes. Uh, Chris, in 2003, I debated Richard Swinburne uh, here in the United States on the question of does God exist? And I attacked his Bayesian analysis, his effort to claim that Bayesian analysis shows a greater probability that God did exist because of first cause and fine tuning, what have you. And the way I attacked it, and he actually didn't even defend his position, which surprised me, was I said, given that the Bayesian analysis requires prior background information, we have no prior background information of the supernatural. So therefore, that is the link in his Bayesian analysis that destroys his argument. I appreciate your comment. Yeah, it, it, it all comes back to metaphysics then if we've got no empirical basis, so certainly. I'd, I'd love to see the paper. Any other questions for Chris? Well, thank you for that review. Please, please consider on. So before we start with our uh, fifth speaker out of six, uh, just want to remind you if this looks like fun. And by the way, how are we doing so far? Are you enjoying the talks? Thank you very much for supporting these six. Uh, so if you think it would be fun to stay up all night worrying about the talk on Sunday, you can apply for a 15-minute slot. We usually send out the call for papers around January. Um, you can find me at uh, Google Ray Hall at Fresno State. And just uh, contact me if you have any interest in presenting a paper next year, and let me know. We have a little bit of a vetting process, but uh, uh, are we ready for the next speaker? We have a little bit of a video thing going on. Let me just check real quick. Looks like we are ready, almost. So our next speaker is uh, Michelle Nair, and she is um, a secondary science school teacher who is now pursuing um, her doctoral degree in education. Uh, she's come to speak to us about, uh, well actually she's at the Curriculum and Instruction and Department at uh, Purdue University, and she's going to tell us about, uh, let's see, what is the title of her talk? Teaching the Nature of Science, and she's making the case that it's a social justice argument. So Michelle? Thank you. I must have been a bit nervous. Um, 
I spent five years speaking in front of 135 hormone-riddled eighth graders, but for some reason I'm a, a little nervous speaking in front of rational people. Um, so go figure. Um, like I said, I was a teacher for uh, five years. I spent most of that time teaching eighth grade physical science, although I did teach environmental chemistry, forensic science, which was a lot of fun. Um, but unfortunately, I really wasn't happy with the public school system, and I resigned in 2008. I pursued photography, and I did pretty well. I sold some prints, and I was really happy. But I am an educator, and that's my passion. So in 2011, I decided to go back and get my PhD. And I'm, like Ray said, I'm currently studying at Purdue University in the curriculum and instruction department in the curriculum studies program. Most of my work focuses on multicultural education, um, but I can't give up my science roots. Science is embedded in everything, and I think you will all agree. So when I took up the study of the nature of science, I did it with a curriculum studies lens, more specifically, a cultural education, or sorry, multicultural education perspective, which includes a strong social justice component. In a paper I recently wrote, I proposed that an understanding of the nature of science may provide learners with tools to transform societal norms that reflect greater social justice. In other words, teachers should be teaching children the nature of science with the direct purpose of promoting social justice. With social justice meaning all people are treated with fairness, respect, dignity, and generosity. There are many theories regarding the nature of science, from Pop Popper to Farabin to Kuhn to Chalmers. And then there are various sociological explanations of the nature of science. Due to time constraints, I will not go into these definitions or ideas. Though for the purpose of this talk, it's important to distinguish between science, scientific knowledge, and the nature of science. Science offers the best explanation of our natural world available at the time. Scientific knowledge changes as new discoveries are made and new technologies are developed. The nature of science is the process of developing scientific knowledge. And this process includes critical thinking, gathering evidence, skeptically questioning, and peer review. One of the intents of teaching science is to create scientifically literate citizens, which Bill Nye spoke about last night. And one function of scientifically literate citizen is to use the process of science in solving problems, making decisions, and furthering his own understanding of the universe. Using the process of science, or the nature of creating scientific knowledge, to make decisions and solve problems. In addition to producing scientifically literate citizens, there are other arguments as to why teaching about the nature of science is important. These include a utilitarian argument. People need to know how to use science and technologies that are available to them in everyday life. That seems obvious, I guess. We would be lost with our smartphones. A cultural argument. We need to understand the complexities that go into making scientific knowledge in order to appreciate science and its value within society. And a democratic argument. People are bombarded with scientific and pseudoscientific claims all the time. Through social media, the news, magazines, television shows, and political propositions. They are expected to make decisions, whether it be just daily lifestyle decisions or voting decisions, based on their understanding of the nature of science. As I engaged with the philosophical and sociological aspects of the nature of science, I found myself asking, shouldn't we use science and its methods to promote social justice? 
And this is where my multicultural education comes in. So I proposed a social justice argument. Teachers need to equip children with the understanding of the nature of science, critical thinking, skepticism, evidence-based reasoning, in order to combat things like racism, sexism, heteronormativity, and homophobia. Or in other words, to promote social justice, fair treatment for all. When confronted with uncritical stereotypes, black people are criminals, girls are poor at math, gay men are pedophiles, students need to be taught to ask, is that true? What is the evidence? By demanding answers to these questions and by evaluating the evidence, I am confident that students will come to socially just conclusions and act accordingly. So how can teachers teach towards social justice? Teachers need to be skeptical of canned curriculum. They need to make necessary changes to create curriculum that promotes or results in socially just actions. By reflecting on questions such as, why did I choose the curriculum? How do the explicit and implicit messages promote social justice? How can I adapt the curriculum to make it relevant to my students? In addition, teachers can seek out curriculum that promotes social justice. JREF offers free K-12 curricula that addresses areas of scientific skepticism, critical thinking through investigations of paranormal, paranormal, pseudoscientific, and fringe claims. These modules give students a chance to engage in the nature of science through examining topics such as astrology, ESP, and illusions. Also by promoting critical thinking and skeptical questioning, by allowing students to share their perspectives, by making predictions based on their prior knowledge, and by demonstrating the failure of hypotheses which isn't always done in science classes. In other words, they're given the tools to become critical, skeptical thinkers. James Randi and the JREF use skepticism, science, and education to expose unjust acts. Why shouldn't teachers use skepticism and other elements of the nature of science to encourage students to question and ultimately change unjust social norms. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. So any questions for Michelle? Uh, so I think Science is intrinsically interesting. If you just show people the universe, they'll, they'll see it. It's awesome. And that we don't need to like, tell them why science is worth studying. But I also think that when people come to science from the angle of, of having a particular political ax to grind, that can have a danger of biasing the science. Uh, for example, Steven Pinker's book, uh, The Blank Slate and the Modern Denial of Human Nature, uh, has a lot of examples of that. Um, so what do you think of that? I think the processes of science ultimately get to the truth. And I think whether it's a moral truth or a scientific truth, I think the processes of science will get there. I think it's wrong to be racist. Maybe I'm biased in that sense. But I think that you can use science and evidence-based knowledge to create a better world. If I could add to this question, perhaps he's asking, um, how do you get past perhaps a ideology that is resistant to the uh, facts of science, uh, facts that science come to? That, that's kind of a challenge for teachers. I don't teachers. know. <laughs> yes, it's a challenge. So we can put it out there. Any other questions? Michelle. Oh, sorry. Let me take a minute. I'll come back.
Sure. Uh, like ma many skeptics who sometimes give them the question, uh, you know, uh, science is just another religion, um, you know, at some level, we, you know, they'll say, we have faith that these journal articles are true. Um, how do you answer that question that science uh, is not equal to religion? Because science is based on evidence and skepticism and peer review and, and just the whole process of science is not a religion, right? Well, just in the definition of it. I think we could get a team of philosophers up on the panel <laughs> and take that question for an hour or two. I would think on your slide on evaluating curriculum, you first should see if there's anything there that goes against social justice. I agree with you. And, and also, it seems like if you're trying to get something into the curriculum, you have to be careful that you're not being ideological. I agree and I disagree. I think that, um, I think you're right. I think we need to present evidence and we need to let students decide for themselves, which is what, what um, the JREF curriculum does. And I think that's what a good teacher does. A good teacher presents the content, presents the curriculum, and allows the student to work through and create their knowledge based on their perspectives and on their experiences. I don't know if that answered your question, but. Thank you, Michelle. Our final speaker today is uh, Steve Kuno. He is the president and founder of Response Agency. Uh, hold your seats. It's an evidence-based marketing firm, which is, I hear that every day. Uh, he's, this is, uh, I think, your third time on the stage for, for uh, correcting me. I don't want to admit that. Okay, well, we saved Ace in the Hall. Our final speaker, Steve. Good morning, everybody. Nice to see you all here. My name is Steve Kuno, and I'm going to talk today about what you always wondered about advertising. An insider fesses up. I'm the insider who's fessing up. Uh, speaking of advertising, I'm starting with a commercial. Some of you know that I'm the co-author of a book by a former polygamist, former Mormon wife. Uh, it's called It's Not About the Sex, My Ass. And some, <laughs> thank you. Some of you have asked me about it. I happen to have some copies with me, so if you're interested, grab me after. How's that for advertising? Hmm? Now, I'm going to dispel some myths about advertising, and some of you may think that I'm only up here defending myself, because many of you don't like advertising and you may not like me. I'm really not here to defend myself or advertising. I do want to dispel myths, because I think if you're going to dislike me, you really ought to do so from an informed perspective. So, enough about me, and let's talk about you. I happen to know what kind of a link most of you are more inclined to click on. I know when you walk into a store which direction most of you are likely to wander, right or left. Here's a hint. If you're from the United States, you'll probably wander to your right. If you're Karen Stolzno, you'll probably wander to your left. I know what kind of an envelope to send you in the mail that you're more likely to open. And if I put a, a letter inside that envelope, I know where you are likely to start reading. I also know which time of day, which day of week, and which month of the year you are more likely to respond to certain kind of advertisements than others. I even know, if you're interested in learning to do some auto mechanics, I even know that about 20% of you would rather learn to fix a car than repair it. Now, since I know all this stuff, and before you sick the hounds on me, let me tell you how I know this. I know it by putting stuff out there and watching what you do. And if you respond positively to the ad, I'll do more of it. And if you don't respond positively to the ad, I will try something else. Now, that has to be really disappointing because the mythology about advertising is so much more juicy. So, let's dispel some of those myths. I get this all the time, that we know how to control minds. 
that we hypnotize you somehow, or short of that, we find a way to make you somehow do something you wouldn't normally do. We, we evil advertising geniuses know how to do that. Okay, no, we don't know how to do that. No advertiser on earth knows how to make you act against your will, how to make you make a buying decision without knowing why. We don't have that power. If we did, then the best advertising minds in history would not have come up with advertisements for the following failed products. And I swear I'm not making these up. By show of hands, how many of you out here today are wearing big disposable underwear? <laughs> for that matter, how many of you want to smell like a hog? I present Harley Davidson Eau de Toilette. Now mind you, the best advertising minds in the world were out pushing these products. They failed. You know, if you're hungry, there's nothing quite like a frozen dinner from the makers of Colgate Toothpaste. And speaking of appetizing, wouldn't you love some yogurt from the people who tell you every month 50 ways to please your man? I give you Cosmopolitan brand yogurt. And speaking of appetizing again, how about for the kids, purple ketchup from Heinz. Absolutely bombed. Here are a couple of more recent product failures some of you may have heard of that were backed by incredibly huge budgets. How many of you remember New Coke? How many of you tried it? How many of you liked it better? That's why it's gone. And it didn't matter what the ad said, did it? So if we advertisers are good at turning you into robots and making you buy against your will, we are doing a very good job of hiding it. But where on earth do the myths come from? Well, we can go back to 1957, when a man named James Vickery held a press conference, and he told the press that he had tried an experiment in a movie theater. He arranged with a theater owner during the movie Picnic, which was a hit at the time, to flash on the screen at one three thousandth of a second, once every five seconds, a hidden message. It either said, thirsty, drink Coke, or hungry, have some popcorn. At the end of about a four to six week experiment, he discovered that Coca-Cola sales went up 18.1% and popcorn sales went up 57.7%. Now you can imagine when that hit the media, that caused outrage. So much outrage that five years later when James Vickery admitted to having made the whole thing up, no one really noticed. You know what happens with retractions? They're not as much fun as the sensationalized account. So, we have that. Now, in fact, the idea of subliminal advertising controlling you has persisted to this day. You will still find people writing about it in all seriousness and citing this case study as if it is valid. In fact, 20 years after Vickery did his stuff, Wilson Brian Key wrote Subliminal Seduction, where essentially he saw pareidolia everywhere, but he didn't call it pareidolia. He called it advertising people manipulating you with sexual images. In the book on the left, there's a photo of, of some booze with ice cubes, and somehow Mr. Key saw naked women in the ice cubes, and that was making people buy the booze. But my favorite key book to hate is The Clam Plate Orgy, where he found that Howard Johnson's had photos on their menus of clams, and in the photos of clams were hidden messages about sex and also naked women. So. The poor guy, he saw sex everywhere he looked. I feel sorry for his wife when he came home and stared at the wallpaper too long. But since he was so obsessed with menus, I have to digress for just a minute and share this menu with you. This is a photocopy of a, copy of a menu that was printed in Salt Lake City for a restaurant. I've obscured their name. Uh, I don't know how many of these had been used among customers before somebody noticed the typo. It's about six down under entrees. I don't know if you can see it. Here, let me, uh, let me magnify that for you. Roast dick with a red currant sauce. I wonder what Wilson Brian Key would have made of that. Think of all the helpless people ordering that without knowing why. Another source of the myths, of course, is, is yellow journalism. Sensationalism sells. Nobody wants to read an article that says, well, advertising didn't unduly influence anyone today. And you get the media reports about laboratory tests. These are fun. 
These tests do exist. The uh, testers will bring subjects into a laboratory. They'll hook up an FM, uh, fMRI, or they'll check for galvanic response. They'll show these people ads, and they'll say, oh, look, this brain area lit up where there was a galvanic response. That means they're going to go by. A couple of years ago, there was a, a study out that really bothered people because it showed that an advertisement could implant a false memory. People saw the commercial and thought they had consumed the popcorn, which, in fact, they had not consumed. And everyone concluded, ah, this will make you buy. Wait a minute, this is a laboratory. Translating that into action in the marketplace is a whole other thing. And my own personal experience measuring and tracking advertising, which incidentally most advertising agencies do not do, is that there is no connection between the laboratory response and the real market response. So when you put all this stuff in the lab, it's interesting and it may tell you something about how our minds work, but in terms of data, that's all you get. Another sort of, myth of the mythology is you and me, people. We love to spread rumors when we hear about it. And advertising is kind of a love-hate thing we have going on. If somebody says, I saw this commercial, it was great, everybody piggybacks and talks about the commercial they love. If somebody says, those damned advertisers are controlling us, everybody piggybacks on that, and, and away it goes. Uh, we also like someone to blame, don't we? I mean, face it, I would much rather blame McDonald's advertising for my gut, then admit that I just can't resist the sausage McMuffin with egg. Oh my goodness. The industry itself is a source of the rumors. In his book, Adverti Ogilvy on Advertising, the late icon of advertising, David Ogilvy, told a story of hiring a hypnotist to create a commercial. And he said the result was so compelling, it terrified him, so he took a match to it and barely avoided involving his client in a national scandal. Uh-huh. Okay, no copy survives for us to look at. No testing was done. And you know, commercials don't make themselves. We have never heard from the director of photography, the director, the director of lighting, the editor, the actor, or even the hypnotist. This smacks of a story that Ogilvy invented to make clients want to hire his agency. And by the way, the mythology that we advertise in people somehow know how to control you is something that serves our industry when we're trying to convince clients to give us money to make their ads. Another thing we do is gather ordinary everyday people into a room and we show them the ads and, and we ask them, what do you think about the ads? Do you think you would buy if you saw the ad? Now that's just plain silly. People cannot predict their own behavior and I'm going to prove that to you right, by, right now. If you knew no one was watching, by show of hands, how many of you will not wash the next time you use a public restroom? <laughs> you know what? Some 80% of you are either mistaken or lying. Consider that before you shake hands with anyone today. Another myth that the industry perpetuate, perpetuates, and this serves the industry, is that all advertising works. You know what? Most advertising does not work. And and some of it drives sales down. It's very unusual when an ad actually drives sales up. Those are the ones you hear about. But you don't hear about all the failures. But the advertising industry is very good at saying the ads work no matter what. Here's how they do it. If sales went up, they go to their clients and they say, wow, look, the advertising campaign worked. If sales went down, they go to the client and they say, good thing you ran the ad campaign or they would have gone down more. It's, it's a wonderful business when you can't lose. Another myth is that if you remember the ad, it was effective. How many remember the Taco Bell Chihuahua? Yeah, I loved that campaign, didn't you? And I attended a presentation by the head of marketing for Taco Bell, and he showed the slide and he showed how sales, uh, I'm sorry, how popularity of the campaign and people remembering the ad just went through the roof. He also showed us what happened to sales at the same time, they went through the floor. It seemed that people loved the ad and they thought chihuahuas were great, but they weren't buying tacos. So they retired the cute taco that everybody loved and they went back to very mundane close-ups of chopping lettuce and tomatoes and, and sizzling beef laced with oatmeal. And sales went back up again. We get accused of creating greed, nonsense. Greed is a human trait. I do admit that we capitalize on it, but we didn't give it to you. Uh, we get accused of causing goods to cost more. No. No board of directors ever sat down and said, you know, we should start advertising. Well, how will we pay for it? Let's increase prices. They divert fun funds from somewhere else. And when you hear of astronomical advertising budgets, 
you know, look at what McDonald's, the billions McDonald's spends. If you took that and divided it up over all the units sold, you wouldn't even see prices go down by a penny. Advertising often, however, increases volume of purchase, which creates economies of scale, which allows them to sell the product for less, which is why a lot of electronic things nowadays cost less than they did once upon a time. We get accused of creating social ills. That's sort of true and sort of not. We, we actually kind of reflect what society is doing. If there's something happening in advertising you don't like, chances are it's sourced in something that's happening in society. This doesn't make me very popular when I say this, but advertising usually trails behind what culture is doing. Uh, here's a hot button example. We get accused of pushing pink on girls and blue on boys. Incidentally, those are my grandchildren. Clap if you think they're cute. I'm glad you did that. We weren't leaving this slide until you did that. <laughs> this is kind of true and kind of not true. Advertising does, does push products on people that they didn't know they wanted. The classic example would be post-it notes. No one knew they needed a post-it note until advertising pushed it. They gave up free samples and suddenly no one could live without them. Poll strategies are easier and more common. It's where we figure out what the market wants and we let them pull it out of us. Much, much easier to do. One of my clients had a catalog where he was marketing products for horses, saddles, bridles, riding crops. A vendor came to him and said, put my pink riding crop in your catalog. My client said, no way. Now, most of his customers were middle-aged women for some reason. But he said, no one's going to buy this darn thing. So he gave it a tiny space in the back of the catalog. Sales were overwhelming. And the way the catalog business works is if people are pulling your product, you keep increasing the size of the ad in every edition of the catalog. So eventually, this thing was consuming half a page toward the front of his catalog, and it was his best-selling item for a couple of years. Now, was he pushing pink on women? No, women were pulling it from him. But let's be honest, most strategies have a bit of push and pull, and marketers do push pink on women and girls. And meanwhile, girls are pulling pink. Not all girls, and girls would rather wear some other color. But if you're a marketer, your job is to supply what people want, and lots of people want pink. So that's my granddaughter again. Clap. <laughs> and yes, she's a princess. I apologize to anyone that offends. Uh, all right, let's put advertising under a microscope real quick. Oh, and talk about what it does, but we've got 13 seconds. Advertising can't, I'll do it quick. Advertising can't control minds, but it lies all the time. And that's what we should be concerned about. Oh, Ray says I've got more time. The f Thank you, Ray. The first kind of lying, the first level of lying that advertising gets away with is called puffery, which is essentially exaggerating a claim. And the idea is, I know I'm exaggerating, you know I'm exaggerating, and it's all in good fun. And here's an example. Here's a fishing tackle that claims more hits than Google. I don't believe that's a literally true claim. It's kind of cute, though, and I hope you agree with me that it's harmless. Not all puffery is harmless. This is for joint juice. Uh, here's a golfer and his lower back, or maybe it's his butt crack, is yelling yippee. <laughs> okay, there's puffery. Butt cracks don't yell. Well, actually. Um, but the claim, the explicit claim in the headline really bothers me. Joint juice make backs are happy to play 18 more holes. Drink this stuff, your back will quit being sore, you can play 18 more holes. I don't see this as puffery, I see this as quackery and a little bit dangerous. Next level of lying in advertising, now I have to back up. Most advertising is honest, it's above board, I mean it's my profession, these are my peers, most advertising people are quite honest, but there are some scoundrels out there and that's what we're talking about right now, the, the bad apples. Uh, and weaseling is pretty common. Uh, weaseling has to do with telling the truth, so it, uh, telling us uh, something so that it's technically true, but it's meant to mislead. That may sound familiar to some of you. Uh, I have always said that if you have to say technically, you're lying. Michelin ad. Stop up to 19 feet shorter with a Michelin tire. Okay, and it shows these cute animals that are not being run over by a car. The problem is, up to 19 feet includes zero. <laughs> and shorter than what? Well, if you read the type, uh, they're comparing themselves against one tire in very specific conditions. I call this weaseling. Okay, it's true, but they're weaseling. Uh, also, if you happen to know, as I do, that when you're browsing through a magazine, 
80% of browsers will read the headline and not the rest of the ad. So they have just conveyed a false impression. I don't think that's honest. I don't do that kind of thing when I do my work. Finally, there's out and out lying. And you'd be amazed at the advertisers who can get away with it for three reasons. One is that regulatory bodies are busy and they're not running around chasing false advertising claims. When you see something, you say, that's false advertising, why aren't they in jail? Because no one's going to chase them. Most false advertising claims are civil suits filed not by government and not by individuals, but by com competitors. The most famous one I can remember is when uh, Coca-Cola sued Pepsi years ago. Their claim was that if Pepsi, if you took the Pepsi logo and turned it upside down and squinted at it, it looked like the Coke logo. And there was a big suit about that. Another reason they can get away with lying is that some of them have false identities or they're out of the country and you can't find them. But the biggest and most, most loathsome way that some bad advertisers get away with lying, and it just slipped my mind, isn't that great? <laughs> It'll come to me. Oh, it's that they can make money anyhow. You pay a fine, but you've made so much more money than the fine that it's worth it to keep going. And you pay another fine, and you pay another fine, but you're more profitable than the fines, so you keep going. Would you like a perfect example of that? Look to Kevin Trudeau, who is still making money from jail on his fraudulent products. What can we do about it? Well, for one thing, we cannot buy the darn product. Don't expect the marketer, thank you, don't expect the marketer to notice we're a small pond. But there is this personal integrity thing, and I have to tell you, it's easier said than done. For instance, I happen to think Whole Foods lies, or at least weasels, in its advertising. But you know what? I love their deli. So if you see me sometime in the deli, you can call me a hypocrite, and you'll be right. Uh, the other problem is that with a lot of companies, if you dig deep enough, you'll find a wart. And so we all have to draw our own boundaries, live our own standards, and not judge others who draw different boundaries. But we cannot buy the darn product. You know, for instance, I won't go to Hobby Lobby, but lest... <laughs> Thank you. But lest you be too impressed, they don't sell anything I want. I might as well, I might as well stand up here and, and pledge not to chew aluminum foil. We can write, we can blog, we can write letters to the editor. Um, I happen to be published in a number of advertising journals, and so I've written articles, I don't know if you can see this, the headlines are like morality and marketing of caveat emptor and fertilizer because they wouldn't put bullshit in the headline. And, and I have to give these publications credit. Number one, they're paying for these articles, but number two, they run them, and they're going to offend a lot of their readers. One of them has a... Uh, you know, I've got one called How Ethical Is Your Direct Marketing that ran in a, a magazine with a circulation of 300,000 among marketers. And so there's something you can do. You can raise your voice. You may not get any advertisers to change what they do, but you might warn off potential marks, and that is worth something. So we've looked at some advertising myths, and we've talked about what advertising can do, and most of it, I think, is, is helpful. It promotes a good economy, which is good for us. Sometimes it brings needed products and services to our attention. And that's a good thing. Uh, for instance, the advertising industry pretty much created the demand for deodorant in the 60s. Without being too obvious, sneak a look at the person sitting next to you. And now if you're grateful that advertising pushed deodorant on us, raise your hand. <laughs> now, I do want to end on a positive note. So I want to show you a big, obnoxious, in your face, can't get away from an ad that I kind of like. Oh, there's the deodorant one. And there you have it. Thank you very much. Do you feel like any questions? Oh, that's how you find me. I'd love to hear from you. <laughs> what would you say about the uh, relationship of advertising? models and young women having a rise, or maybe, uh, maybe it's a myth, in anorexia? That's a good question. The question was, how does anorexia tie to advertisers using skinny models? Well, there's, I think we're back to a push and pull thing. Definitely, advertising is helping promote the problem. 
Where did it start? In movies and popular culture, I don't know, but advertising again follows, picks up on that, uses skinny models, women want to be skinny. It's a tragedy. It's awful. Just like the blue and pink thing. I mean, that's really unfair to girls who want to wear something besides pink and boys who do want to wear pink. But there is no conspiracy, back to pink for a minute, to push pink. If girls' color of choice tomorrow turned out to be green, you can bet that pink would be on the clearance racks and, and green would be sold. And if suddenly Rubenesque women became the trend, advertising would show that. They'd take a little while to catch up, but they would do it. Do you think that advertising as an industry is overly enamored with uh, things that we might learn in neurobiology and thinking that they can actually take advantage of the way our brains work? Absolutely. Uh, that's why you see all this laboratory testing going on. And what it really does is, so far it has not established how to make a more effective advertisement. It has shown how to sell your advertising agency services to a client. If advertising can't cause large numbers of people to buy a, or to take a bad or inferior product, why is politics completely dominated by raising money for advertising? Wonderful question. My personal view, were it possible, and it really is, would be to ban advertising and keep it out of politics altogether. Uh, you know, if I sell you a bar of soap that you don't like, you're out a couple of bucks. If I sell you a president you don't like, you could be out wars, ruined economies, all kinds of things. And so that's a shame. I've, I've, I've pondered this. There's no practical way to get advertising and promotion out of politics, but it's a shame. But to your question, then all the fundraising that is directed to political advertising, how effective is it? Good question. You know, there seems to be an indicator that the client more likely to win can raise more money. And so again, we've got this chicken and egg thing going on. Uh, much political advertising, though, is hopelessly ineffective. It's just name recognition, which, for instance, Hillary Clinton already has. And, and name recognition is kind of another myth about advertising effectiveness. How many of you recognize the name Ford Edsel? Yeah, didn't sell too many of them. Good question, thank you. Uh, I haven't watched a regular television program in years. Everything I recorded, because I don't think it's possible to watch 60 minutes without zooming through the commercials. So how do you fix that? <laughs> well, that's a good problem that advertisers are facing. This market is getting more and more segmented. When I went to college, we had radio, TV, newspaper, magazines, billboards, direct mail. That was it. Now we've got this thing called the internet that is all of the above. And like you, I don't watch broadcast TV. I stream. I'm very hard to hit with an advertisement now. You can get me through Facebook, but those are largely ineffective. You can get me online. And actually, it's really fun because online ads are extremely accountable. Either you click or you don't, and people know if you're clicking, and so it kind of holds an advertiser's feet to the fire. What I really love is when I'm, I'm looking up a page I want to see, and up comes a commercial, fine, someone has to pay for this page I want to see, and then suddenly it says, you can click out of this ad now. Love that, because it puts the advertiser's feet to the fire. They have to make a commercial that you want to see. Good! Yeah, one more question. I'm sorry, we're running out of time. I wanted to ask uh, a little bit more peripheral question. What are the ethics in advertising? Uh, specifically, very recently we had the, the Facebook thing where they did this study where they try to change people's moods. And I was wondering if you could comment a little bit on that uh, in the short time we have left. I appreciate that. We, we chatted privately about this the other day. First of all, the Facebook thing wasn't an advertising experiment, but I don't care. It's kind of the same principle when I talk about putting things out there and seeing what people do. You know, the way I might test, uh, I'll tell you how I tested an ad for It's Not About the Sex My Ass on Facebook. We had two ads, headline A, headline B, and I ran them both and I counted the clicks and I found that people liked headline B better, so I got rid of headline A. That's not, call that manipulative if you want, I just call it being smart. But now the Facebook experiment, where they played with your mood over time. That's a whole other matter. It should have called for informed consent, informed consent. Apparently no calamities came out of it, but could have. In the old days, they used to stage psychological experiments on the street. They'd create a trauma, and they'd see what onlookers would say or do. And finally they realized, you know, it's not really ethical to pretend to have somebody killed by a car in front of innocent people. 
That is effectively what Facebook did with their experiment, and I don't approve of it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes uh, the 12th Sunday Papers of 10. Thank you very much for attending this morning.